Hello there, my name is Terry, and welcome to another episode of the Animation Industry Podcast. Today, I'm chatting with one of the creators of Dragonframe software, Jamie Kaliri. And if you're unfamiliar with what Dragonframe is, it is the foremost stop motion animation software on the market today. It's used by pretty much every stop motion studio in the world, and there's a good chance you've seen a feature film produced using it. For example, Kubo and the Two Strings, The Missing Link, I Love Dogs, Early Man, and Frank and Weenie were all made using Dragonframe. So in this chat, Jamie's gonna share the story of how Dragonframe came to be, as well as his personal journey into the animation industry. And if you're unfamiliar with Jamie's work, besides Dragonframe, he is a multiple award-winning director who's got an Emmy, a number of Annies, and a whole bunch of other awards for commercials and music videos that he's directed, all of which he's going to go into further detail in our chat. So let's jump right in. Hi, Jamie. Thanks so much for coming on the chat today. How are you doing? I'm doing all right. Thanks for having me on the show. I've been I'm... in lockdown. It's the coronavirus time, so we've been hanging out with family a lot. Uh, well, we are all doing that. <laughs> everybody's, everybody's in. Uh, it's an interesting time for sure right now. Um, so yeah, I want to talk a lot about J Dragon Frame because uh, you are one of the co-founders, and I think that's incredible. Dragon Frame is an amazing tool that I personally love, and I know stop motion people all over the world use it. Um, so I do want to chat about how that came to be and all that fancy stuff. But first, I want to know kind of your story of getting into this industry. So where, where did everything begin for you? Well, where things began for me in terms of the animation industry would have to have been really starting at CalArts. I, I didn't really know there was a thing as the animation industry when I went to CalArts. I, I went there first for photography, and um, this was uh, in the late uh, 80s. But I'd always loved like theater and performance. I was always like a performing kid, and I loved storytelling, and I loved movies and, and filmmaking. And I'd had, I had done some film work. Um, just on my eight millimeter camera and a little bit of uh, stop motion, but I never was like, a, um, oh, let me build little characters kind of, you know, animator. I, I did more I don't know, just moving stuff. And it was just kind of, you know, an extra thing I did along with some other film, film stuff. Well, wait, I did wait, wait, wait. So you surely you'd seen movies and cartoon shows and stuff. So you knew that there was an animation industry, I guess. Right. But I hadn't. It hadn't occurred to me ever that I would be a part of the animation industry. That was oh, gotcha. my goal. I just like making imagery and I like entertaining people. Wasn't sure what I was going to do. I thought maybe I'd be a photographer. I got into CalArts in the photography program, but immediately, right when I got there, I took an animation course. And it was actually in the experimental animation department where I meet, immediately met a lot of really interesting, talented people there. What happened for me, I got really lucky, was that there was a contest for making MTV interstitials. You know, I was just kind of walking around campus one day and I saw one of my um, friends who was in the experimental animation class that I was taking. And he had this Bolex hooked up to a piece of wood with like an animation peg bar at the other end. And he was getting people to like hold it. And I couldn't tell what was going on, but he was running around campus shooting this crazy thing. I was, what are you doing? And uh, he said, oh, don't you know, this is an MTV contest and everybody's making these little MTV IDs. So I just thought, well, that sounds like fun. And I, even though I wasn't in the film program, I just sort of uh, begged, borrowed and stole equipment, got lights. And I got my uh, roommate to uh, work with me on it. His name was Barry Bond. And he was uh, more of an artist than I was. So I was doing storyboards. And then I got guys down the hall who did art and, and they, were in the, they were in the character animation um, department. When I say down the hall, I mean in our dorm room and they built props and stuff and we just jammed it all in my dorm room. And then we would take turns animating and I was just learning animation and we were shooting on a Bolex. There was no frame grabbing at all. There was no, basically we just shot it all on a Bolex, every shot one after the next and then sent it all in for developing, you know, when it was all done. And it, I think there was, you know, there had to have been a bunch of shots, must've been like 10, 15 different shots in this thing that we did i remember the film came back and all of us got together and we went in the experimental animation uh, department's back room where they had a projector and we put it up on the projector and we start watching it and, and of course you know what we're really concerned about is you know does it look good but did we make any major mistakes you know and so it it ran and just shot after shot looked pretty good now one thing that the other guys didn't know was that every night when we'd finish the shoot I would then turn all the lights back on and reshoot the shot 
as a safety because I, I was a little worried that maybe the animation wasn't going to be so great. So I, I was shooting these safeties every time. Anyway, it gets to the end of the roll and we all, I mean, we're okay, we're like 19, eight, I mean, I was 18 at the time, you know, we're young guys. We just went crazy, like, yeah, we did it. We got all the shots. Now it wasn't edited yet. Everything was, it wasn't shot perfectly in sequence, but we had the shots and we freaked out. And Jules Ingalls, who was the head of, um, sorry, of experimental animation, he burst in like, what's going on in here? <laughs> like, what are you troublemakers doing in here? <laughs> you know, because experimental animation, you usually, usually don't have people cheering and going crazy. And, uh, and then we showed him the footage and he was like, oh, even though he's more in the ex experimental animation department, and what we had done was a little kind of story with characters and clay guys and stuff. He really appreciated it. He put a good word in the character animation department for me. And uh, I ended up getting accepted in my second semester into the character animation department. So I just kind of got pulled into this world kind of right away. And I just liked making, I liked making films and I loved projecting and seeing people in the theater react to stuff because that little short interstitial that we did, CalArts students altogether made nine of them for this. It was like a worldwide contest, but we had done nine of them. And we had a, a theater screening. There was a, a theater inside of CalArts called the Bijou Theater. It got packed out for the screening of all these interstitials, these MTV interstitials. When uh, ours came up, the audience, when it was over, the audience just went crazy. Definitely was the audience favorite. It wasn't as maybe visually interesting and as experimental as some of the other pieces done, but it definitely was like a crowd pleaser. And that kind of put me on the map really young at CalArts amongst, you know, the animators there. They kind of like, oh, this guy can kind of get something done. And it actually, he knows how to tell a, a little mini story and it's uh, properly exposed. I was, I was like one of these guys that always had like a light meter on my belt because that was like my, you know, that was like the one thing I could always do. You know, I was very comfortable with film at that point because I had done photography in high school. You know, that was kind of like my thing at, right away when I got into CalArts was okay he, he can kind of tell a story and he can expose the film and it looks good and he can finish something so I immediately kind of got pulled into this really cool group of animators and filmmakers in character animation they kind of shepherded me sort of these older guys you know through this process of making films and talking about films and it was just really a super fun time for me it was very experimental you know, always shooting interesting things. And then I get to see what these other guys were doing because sometimes they would say, you know, I just get these people knocking on my dorm, like, hey, Jamie, can you come check the exposure? We're doing like this backlight pass or whatever. And I, you know, come out of my dorm room and go over, you know, into the school and, and, and be in one of these big dark rooms with the giant Oxbury cameras. And the film was, a, it was very romantic to, for me back in those days. So that was, you know, that was kind of, I guess, how I got started. Now, how I actually got wait, wait, wait. You didn't you didn't say if you end up, ended up what happened with the contest with MTV? Did oh, you yeah, end up yeah. Oh, placing sorry. or oh, well, the, well, I was a like a semi-finalist of some sort, good enough that they invited me to a big screening and party that they had in at the New Art Theater. Mine was not one of the finishers, but another guy at Calis, Eric Darnell, his won the, the whole contest. It was really fun. Like uh, I think Thomas Dolby was one of the um judges he was one of the judges and um all the you know hip mtv people were there there was this giant party afterwards in this tent and i ran into all these people young people who had submitted their work and were in the contest that i would later in the industry run into who became you know well-known directors and it was it was kind of an interesting weird little microcosm of what would become like the next sort of wave of of people in the animation industry. Oh, and by the way, all different styles. You know, I mean, mine yeah. was stop motion, but um, Eric did this. His whole piece was done with um, optical printing and eight millimeter footage of animals, and and then he did this crazy thing of people saying MTV backwards, I believe, and then it was played forward, and so it sounded really weird. And so they were definitely leaning towards something more experimental, um, MTV, because you know his was the one that really finished. But I I actually you know, being young and ridiculous, I went up and actually asked one of the judges at the party, I go, well, what about my film? <laughs> <You know? laughs> like, what about? And it was really kind of cool because the guy said, well, what you guys made was excellent, but we're kind of moving away from like the clay animation thing and we're trying to look for more experimental stuff and something with more of an aesthetic. It was like kind of a trigger went off like, oh, okay. All right. Yeah, I get it. That's what I need to do. I need to really kind of create my own aesthetic. 
And so it was really great. An amazing learning experience for me, thrust around all these, you know, uh, yeah, talented it, people right in my first semester of school. Sounds um, crazy ambitious. I can't even imagine doing a project on top of schoolwork and then reanimating all the shots from that project on my own afterwards. <laughs> That's, plus, plus, like, back in the day when you're doing things, I mean, film had to get developed. You had to use all the sophisticated tools and stuff. And now we just work on a computer, so it's much easier yeah, even. Yeah. So, well, you know, so but there was there was a freedom to it. There was a freedom to not knowing exactly what you were doing. You kind of just set, set up the camera, and then your brain would kind of go into a different mode than it goes into today with the digital because you you kind of go into more of a meditative like all your attention is glued to these moments and what frame you're on and you've got an exposure sheet hopefully you know set next to you and you're checking off boxes and it, it's a much more of a high wire act you know yeah so um so did you finish the rest of your education taking yeah. animation courses then yeah so i stayed in animation i, I focused mostly on the directing side of, of animation story stuff and and also really got into cinematography and ended up yeah. shooting parts of my final project on 35 and I built a uh, camera controller for that well and, it sounds like uh, you have a real kind of pa like originating passion for photography and and cinematography yes. from your experience so I think it's interesting to know that now because you had like a mix of all that experience and then animation and then you went on to direct some shorts so how did you end up uh after school like where did that take you to into the professional industry how did you actually get in so that piece that i did for mtv although i didn't i wasn't a, a finalist in it i was put on some kind of short list of like here's some young people that will probably do something for cheap because the next year, my sophomore year at school, I was in a class and my roommate, Dan Smith, he came up to the doorway and he had a sign in his hand that said HBO called. And like the first thought was, well, we don't even have TV in our room. You know, nobody really did at CalArts then. Apparently, um, our name was handed to, to them and they needed little animated interstitials for a new comedy channel that they were starting that ended up they ended up getting rid of it but at the time they were getting ready to you know to launch this big comedy channel and they needed some cheap you know animations uh, in between the whatever they were showing i didn't really feel confident that i could pull something off super professional by myself so i got my friends together who many of whom had worked in the industry and, and done some cool short films and we all submitted storyboards we decided whoever storyboard they liked, then that person would be the director and everyone else would help them. So it happened to be that my storyboards, um, which I don't think were the best, but it was a, a kind of a funny little gag, they picked it. And so my first actual job was right at the beginning of my, my second year. So I was like 19 years old. I had to go get a bank account and it was for HBO. And I think the gig was like five grand and it was a 10 second. I think it was 10 seconds, maybe. I'm trying to think it was 20 seconds, but I think it was just a 10 second little blip. And it was a, a, a just a dumb little joke where you see this bartender, wait, wait, how'd it go? <laughs> <laughs> no, you see this kind of drunk guy at a bar and he's talking to the bartender and he says, hey, did I ever tell you the joke about the pig and the clown and the nun? And the, and the um, bartender's like, hey man, shut up. And the camera pans over and there's a pig and a clown and nun sitting at the bar next to them. So that was it. It was just a stupid little thing. Huh. The guys ended up drawing the characters, Dave Wasson and um, Chris Miller and Mike Bell and Tom McGrath. I mean, those are all names. If you look up their you know, major guys in animation, they ended up doing an incredible job with it. Um, and I just kind of helped shepherd it along as best I, as I could. You know, we shot it on 16 millimeter and got it transferred and sent it off. And I got the paycheck and everybody got their little, you know, slice of the, of the five grand. Um, so that was like my first, that was my first gig. Nice. So then um, I ended up doing some ads for KCRW while I was still in school. I basically started kind of just putting my feet into the industry while I was a student. So that gave me a lot of confidence that I could pull something off by the time I got out. So there's a radio station called KCRW in LA and they would pay for these like one minute advertisements on, on 35 millimeter that would show in movies the, like the art houses around LA. 
I had already done one of those ads for them while I was a student. And once I graduated, I thought, okay, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to ask them if they'll fund another one of these things that I can do for them. And I'll buy a 35 millimeter camera and I'll buy some gear and we'll shoot it in my apartment in Hollywood. And I'll try to do something really interesting aesthetically that will kind of, you know, this will be my entry into Hollywood. Like everyone in town is going to see this thing on the big screen. And so it ended up being a, a really difficult project. Lots of multiple exposures in camera. It's very tricky. It was a lot of photo cutout work, a lot of like shooting live action, printing the photographs, cutting the photographs, hand tinting the photographs, putting the photographs back into 3D sets, doing camera moves. All my camera moves were like hand cranked moves. Um, oh my gosh. Again, multiple exposures. I mean, sometimes a shot would take two weeks and then I'd make a mistake on the third exposure and have to start over again. Yeah, and then sometimes I'd think I got it right and it, I'd get it back and I'd look at it. I didn't have a movieola myself, so I would screen it at the, um, like at Deluxe, I think was my lab. Maybe it was Technicolor. I think it was actually, now I'm thinking it's Technicolor. And, you know, they would, they would screen it for me, but sometimes these shots were so quick, you know, they were just a lot of like two second shots, one second shot. It's a kind of a quick cut piece that I would kind of go, okay, well, was, did I get it? Did I not get it? And so then I would take the footage to this guy, um, Chris Cassidy, who he did a lot of Roto effects. And he had a company called Roto Effects of America for years. And he had a little bungalow in Hollywood, sweetest guy. And he had all these Roto stands, which are basically like, um, they're basically like an Oxbury down shooter that you can load film into first project down. And then you would, you would, like draw out mats with like, you know, pencils and then Sharpie on, on uh, animation paper. And then when you were done, you would then take the, the shot footage out of the camera and the light that contraption that goes in that projects down through the lens. And then you'd put raw film in and then it becomes a camera. And the idea is that everything is exactly lined up the way it came out. And now it's going in exactly through the same lens and it'll land on the film. And you'd shoot on high contrast, black and white. And that would give you a mat. That's how mats oh, were wow. done in films. And so he had all these little stands in there and he had a moviola. And a moviola was a little upright way to a uh, little machine to watch 35 millimeter footage. So I would go over there after I was done shooting and put my film in and watch it and then go, oh, I didn't get it. And I got to reshoot and I got another two week shot. So anyway, this took almost a year to complete this um, one minute piece, but it, it actually did the trick. It went did into they the give theater. you a deadline of a year or you just like, no, seems... I, just kept, I just kept, I just kept going. <laughs> Uh, but they were happy with what they were seeing when it was done. I mean, I think the thing played for three or four years. Oh, wow. And people talked about it enough that I started getting calls from music video reps. And nice. I got a call, I got a call Is... from this guy, Dante Ariola, who was doing graphic design for Cypress Hills album packages, which were very stylized. And he asked if I would do a cover for a Cypress Hill album. And so I did that for him. And then the opportunity came up that he got to direct a music video. And he said, do you want to kind of co-direct this with me? And so he shot kind of his footage and I shot my footage. I'm not really good at co-directing. So especially after years of being an animation at an art school where you're kind of just doing a lot of stuff by yourself. So I shot my stuff, which was live action and some experimental projection and whatever. And the editor, you know, put it together, but mostly used my footage. And so kind of word went around town like, oh, there's a new guy in music videos. And then next thing you know, just a few months later, I'm, I'm now directing another music video and then another music video. So I had a string of music videos in the 90s, you know, kind of. So that this, was the this was like your your main income during that time. Like this was what you're doing full time. Yeah. I mean, I should say that I was raised by artists. So I was never told like, you got to go get a job. Like yeah. I, all I knew was gig culture. So to me, like, that's what you do. You go from one gig and then you get the next gig. That's just how it works. So, you know, for a while I was doing little animated title-y kind of things and experimental little promotions using animation. I also had a really cool opportunity, which was I worked for a while at Acme Filmworks when they were just starting. I think they were on their second commercial. And I came in as like a technical supervisor. I think they called me assistant director. I would, you know, make sure all the exposures were right. I keep organizing the animation and I work with another director who, you know, wanted to just kind of freeform it. And then I would try to make sure that it all got, you know, put together. And so that was kind of cool because that became a great kind of backup for me because I'd be working on some project and 
And maybe if I was running low on cash, it would just always seem to work out. I get a call from Acme Filmworks like, hey, can you come in? We got this thing. Or, you know, we know somebody that needs an animation supervisor on a project. And so I, I at first it was awesome. One of the funny things about that was that my job security was based on film. I was good at dealing with the complications of film and making sure something's exposed correctly and making sure it's, you know, everything's done right on film. I didn't realize in any way at that age that film was gonna go away for animation. I didn't think that was gonna happen. Uh, didn't see that coming at all. And as it did start to go away, especially like in 2D where it becomes, became much easier to deal with, you know, the coloring and the creating the imagery out of the computer, even if it was scanned drawings, that kind of, there was some work that definitely faded away for me. But, um, but you know, I kind of segued into music videos and that was live action stuff. So I wasn't really sure what I was doing. I was just kind of taking the gigs as they were coming. It kind of sounds like your philosophy was, and you kind of mentioned this from some of the earliest gigs, you wanted them to kind of be your portfolio, I guess, but your philosophy was kind of find some opportunities and then just wow everybody and then the work or the opportunities will come to you. Is that right? Oh, sure. And when should you not have that that right. as a filmmaker, right? I mean, um, I think that every job is an opportunity to make something amazing. You know, I think that the directors that continue to get more and more work are those people who take every opportunity. And, and that means that sometimes you have to say to an art director from an ad agency or whoever starts the project, you might have to say, look, I know you wanted this, but I think I could make this amazing yeah. and, you know, and sort of point in a direction where you can kind of hopefully put a little bit of your signature on it, whatever that is, and maybe tweak some things to make it a great little piece of filmmaking. And I just never underestimated the power of making something small and, you know, refined and as, as good as it could be, as good as I could at least try to pull it off. Yeah, I was going to ask you, well, you just kind of answered, I was going to ask you, what are some of those things that you can do to like push your aesthetic oh, yeah. or, you know? I would so. say the number one thing, I don't know about aesthetic, that's hard for me. I mean, that's such a personal thing, but I will say this, right. the, the universal film language should not be ignored. That studying the very, very basics of filmmaking and the basics of storytelling and looking at great films and taking apart you know, take a movie you love and take a sequence that you think is amazing and just try to break it down. Like, what's going on here? And I did so much of that when I was just very young and just trying to, like, what is this filmmaking thing? Um, mm -hmm. and, and it was because the people around me were doing that. I was surrounded by all these really talented people that were always like, hey, Jamie, have you seen this film? You got to see this sequence or you got to see this thing. And that's where we got our, our inspiration from more than a class and, you know, um, it wasn't about, you didn't do a project to try to impress a teacher. You did a, a project to impress all everyone around you, like the other, the other right. students. What, what so, kind of, sorry, what kind of artists were your parents? I'm just wondering. Well, my father was a musician and he, you know, he was a blues guy and, and rock and roll guy. And uh, my mother was more of a kind of a fiber arts person. She could just make something out of anything. And so she would just kind of reach and be like, oh, I got some fabric. Oh, I think I'll, you know, sew something out of it. Or she did so many different things. I don't even know where to start. But <laughs> she did have this kind of uh, magic ability to kind of create something out of nothing. It was really fun, you know, to always watch her as a kid. Just she'd get an idea. And next thing you know, she's like kind of a, a, a crazy scientist would, you know, come up with some beautiful thing. Uh, and sometimes there'd be some duds. It was great to see that, too, see some some of her experiments and, nice. you know. Yeah. It, and so it sounds grew, like sounds like yeah. they had a, a big influence in rubbing off on uh, what what inspired you too. Um, oh, of course, of course. So I'm wondering, you're you're living in Hollywood, you're doing all these music videos. Can you kind of give like the the highlights of of your directing career? Because I I know like you're the founder of Dragon Frame, and you know that's kind of I guess separate from the directing career. So I want to know how what you were okay. doing in film led into that. So can you go over some okay. of the highlights? Well, some of my highlights, um, well, definitely that KCRW piece I just told you about, although mm -hmm. there, isn't, there isn't a good version of it that anyone could find, but that was a piece that really meant a lot to me because it kind of put me on the map. And it also was stylistically very different. Um, then I did this video for a band called Morphine called Early to Bed, and it was kind of a fun story. It had like kids in this crazy 
puppet monster in it. And that got nominated for um, a Grammy for best video of the year of 97, I think. And so that was kind of a highlight. I did um, a fairly famous music video for a band called Marcy Playground and their song was called Sex and Candy. And that was like number one for like 14 weeks or something on MTV back in the day. Oh, nice. When you when you say I did a music video, for instance, like early to bed, which is a combination of like live action and like editing. What do you what is your involvement in the directing? Are you oh, doing the sh well, shooting? Are you editing too? Oh, right. Like I'm sorry. OK, I was directing. And so the music videos, the, the way that they were done and, and pretty much done nowadays, too, is that the band will reach out to certain directors through their management. And then the director will listen to the music and write up a treatment. And then hmm. the band will get the treatments from the different directors and pick one. And then at that point, you know, as a director, you, you know, you find a producer, you're basically making the thing happen. And so the band is like, some, here's some money. We like your treatment. And I'm, I'm assuming a treatment is like a write up of what's going to be. Yeah. In, yeah it's okay. just a written. Yeah. And nowadays I think they'd be more complicated with more visuals. I just did sort of written treatments. It'd just be like two pages. You know, you don't want to make it too exhausting. Read, kids but, in a in a circus tents are trapped <laughs> yeah exactly then you got to make it happen so then you, maybe you're with a production company at that point that's supporting you and so they're like okay here's some art directors that can build the sets and you know then then you pull the production together some of the music videos i did i also was the director of photography some i i didn't feel like i could do both jobs of directing and being the director of photography but i was always on the camera so maybe somebody else would help me set up the lights and then I would get on the camera and then direct the band. And I always had another editor. I always felt it was good to have somebody else looking at it and seeing it with fresh eyes. And in fact, the morphing video that I was saying I liked so much, I didn't think I got the shots in the can. You know, I didn't, you know, I didn't think I got them. And I was a little bit depressed after I was done shooting. And I drove up to Ojai where my parents lived. And I kind of hid out for a couple of days. And then I got a call from them saying, hey, you know, the editor's got the footage, they have the treatment, we've got a cut ready for you to look at, come come look at it. And I went to go see it. And it was actually like, oh, this is really, this could be something pretty good, but we need a little bit more footage. And at that point, we shot another, we shot some more footage in LA because the, the shoot was in New York. So then we shot some, a few more things in LA to kind of fill it up. And it ended up turning out to be a cool little video. Did I answer your question or did I go, did I? Yeah, yeah, no, that was perfect. I mean, I wanted to know kind of what your involvement was in the actual production of the of the music video. That's awesome. Um, yeah, it's pretty much your your baby. Your music videos, they kind of just get handed to you. And if you're with a production company, they'll support you. And, you know, they're there to support your vision, but also to get it done on time and under budget. And you just try to work together to, to make it happen. Yeah. So is, I'm just curious because you ended up doing a bunch of music videos. Did you have like a little production company that you started to develop or like people you always work with or is it kind of well i started at duck studios and i was doing little commercials for them i did like a fruitopia commercial which was like a pepsi product i did a bunch of stuff with them so when i got my first music videos they produced them and they were trying to get a live action division started it was called the front and we were basically just starting it up but then i got kind of lured away by a company called mjz which was an amazing live action commercial company and i did a couple of things with them and then i kind of bounced around to some different companies at that point i eventually ended up going back to duck studios to do the united airlines spots years right later. Yeah, i was going to ask you about um, those so the cool thing about the United Airlines spots, just as a little piece of animation history that's kind of important, is that Acme Filmworks, the place that I, I told you I worked at in the, on their second commercial, the guy that ran that had a great idea, Ron Diamond. He, he thought, well, there's these beautiful films being made in animation, these short films. If I can find these like Academy Award winning short filmmakers and convince them that they should direct commercials, we could use their, their amazing films, make a reel out of it. And that's kind of how he really got Acme Filmworks cooking. He got the eye of United Airlines and they started doing these beautiful United Airlines spots. I don't know what year they started, but almost every one was directed by an Academy Award winning short film animation director. And so he really started this really great line of commercials that got started. But then I think United Airlines was you know, bidding other animation companies and they, and they bid Duck Studios. But actually, let me just back that up a little bit. I got very lucky on that commercial. This is what actually happened. They wanted to go with this other director who bowed out or he, he wasn't interested or timing wasn't right. And then they said, okay, this guy's not gonna do it. 
who else, you know, what else out there is kind of um, turning our heads these days? And they had seen, when I say they, the ad agency for United Airlines had seen my end title sequence on the end of Lemony Snicket's, a series of unfortunate events. Because they had seen that, they said, well, let's figure out who did this. They got a hold of me on that. And I maybe it was through Duck Studios, I don't remember. But that kind of pulled me back into stop motion. I hadn't done stop motion for years. The Lemony Snicket's was a After Effects piece. When we did the Dragon, I convinced them, hey, I know what you liked was After Effects, but I think we could do a version of this in camera stop motion that would be would also be cool. I also really wanted to light things. The After Effects was always kind of a bit um, boring for me because I like physical objects to, to deal with. Did that answer your question? So, so Lemony Snicket was boring. <laughs> the, 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 the no, it was it was it was um, it was difficult. You know, it was all in the computer. I couldn't get my hands on things. I'm a very hands on yeah. kind of yeah. artist. I was working with some some other great director animators who worked on that piece, and they were uh, much better at After Effects than I was. I really had to kind of fight my way through it and through yeah. some pretty difficult stuff on that Lemony Snicket's for what After Effects could do at that time. So I just wanted to be free of, of being stuck inside the computer. I really wanted to bring everything out onto a stage and light it and, and, and get out paint and, you know, make a mess of things, you know. So how, how did you actually end up getting the Lemony Snicket gig in the first place? <laughs> I like your wonder, how do you get these jobs? Well, I'll tell you. Well, I'm I super got, curious. Uh, That's like a. Yeah. Like a... <laughs> well, first of all, I want to just say, um, what's that old adage about luck is, uh, preparation meets opportunity and that is just so true because sounds, it sounds like your whole career almost <laughs> well i think it's i think it's a lot of people's careers and i really think you have to live by that motto because how i got limony was that there was an editing company called mwp in la and they were the sweetest people and they had come in to save the day on my kcrw spot and help me edit it because I was so burnt, kind of, and a little bit mental, honestly, by the end of that, I had basically been like a monk inside of my darkened uh, Hollywood apartment for months on end, and was kind of losing my mind. And they were like, okay, buddy, this is beautiful footage. We want to kind of attach ourselves to this a little bit and help you get it done. So they helped with the sound. They helped edit it. They actually edited it on an edit droid. So they transferred the footage with time code, put it into an edit droid, which was the first digital editing system and, and actually it didn't work off of hard drives it actually worked off of a series of laser discs you load into it it was developed by lucasfilm then when that was all edited in video then the sound could be done but then the time code called key code which is, tells you what actual frame on the film it is then went back to the negative cutter anyway they helped me do that and they then edited a lot of my stuff over the years and i they really knew me pretty well and there was a guy that came to them and said, hey, I, I have an opportunity to do a title sequence. It was a guy who had a graphic design company and they were doing a lot of graphic design for the Lemony Snicket movie. And the director and producer of the movie said, hey, you've done all this beautiful design work. Do you wanna do a title sequence? And they were thinking like, um, just kind of like wallpaper, like just keep it really simple. But then the people at MWP, Mike Miller in particular said, oh no, you got to get Jamie on this because Jamie's work is a little dark and it's a little, but also kind of like whimsical, like you got to get Jamie on this. So I was actually at that point in my career was thinking of getting out of film. This is like 2003, 2004 and, and going into architecture. So I was actually at that moment starting to take classes to get into an architecture school. And they kept bugging me about this limiting snicket thing. And so I finally said, okay, well, I want this much money and it has to be done in, in Ojai and you need to send people out here and you got to rent a house. Anyway, I put up my demands and they said, okay. <laughs> so then well, we were you, in You this... didn't expect them to say yes, I guess. I, I didn't think so. Yeah. Architecture, so, that's totally the no, opposite. It's very, there's a lot of people who do film and directors like, and then have an interest in architecture it's, it, because it's about creating an experience for someone. It's ah. about creating entry points and exit points and it, there's something very similar and i've heard a lot of people who and especially in animation because animation tends to be very like controlled filmmaking who then right. also have interest in in architecture anyway 
they put us up in a, a house rented here in Ohio, a, a, a big house. We had Todd Hemker on it and Benjamin Goldman were the other animators. I was directing and trying to do some of the sequences and storyboarding like crazy. And again, I just thought, you know, I kind of go into this mode of like, let's make it great, let's make it great. And I kept putting all these story elements into it. And I think the director of the movie wasn't so keen on the story elements, but once he kind of saw what we were doing and saw a story reel cut and some music, he's like, okay, that's cool, I'll go ahead. But then we were kind of just left to it. Like uh, I would ask the the director or the producer, um, you know, can we get a, a, a soundtrack maybe from, from uh, Thomas Newman who was doing the music? Could he just suggest a piece of music for us to cut to? And I asked that so many times and the, finally I was like, look, just pick something, leave us alone. We're in the end of this film. Like, you know, they're dealing with their post-production and their, their mess, you know, cause by the time you're you know trying to finish a film. And so what was crazy was I finished it we brought all the files to eFilm and they go to look at it like, this is 11 minutes long with the crawl. Like this is longer than a whole thousand foot roll of film. Like this is not cool, you know? And so then we tried to like speed it up and it didn't work. So the Lemony Snicket end title is one of the longest title sequences. I mean, maybe now because of digital, it doesn't matter, but it just was rare to have it go longer than a, a thousand foot roll of film because that was what they'd have to, you know, print it on. It just turned out the the director loved it. Many of the people who reviewed the film would talk about the end titles. And so suddenly my name was on the map again. I had to really think, okay, am I doing this architecture thing? And uh, and then, you know, like I just said, the, the United Airlines people, the um, ad agency was looking for someone to do something cool. And they saw that. Um, you never know where the opportunities are going to come from. But if you really try to make everything exceptional and stand out, you know, things will bubble up. I, it, it always has. And when I've done work that isn't that great, it's kind of mediocre. Yeah. yeah, I don't. The phone doesn't ring. I've never got a call from someone saying, "I heard you did this project. It's okay, but I heard it came in under budget and on time. So can I hire you?" Never heard yeah, that. Right? <laughs> <laughs> that's that's true. Words have never been spoken. I guess. Uh, my last question about your your directing, um, The Little Prince. How did you end up getting involved in that? Well, I knew Mark from our, the director of the movie for, for a long time. We, we weren't close friends, but we definitely knew each other. And because at CalArts, he was like um, also doing stop motion and I was doing stop motion. So people would always go, oh, do you know Mark? He's doing stop motion. And uh, by the, the way, <laughs> the reason I'm saying it like this is because the CalArts had no stop motion program. So if you were doing stop right. motion, you were kind of like some weird satellite fringe person doing crazy stuff in you know your dorm room. Um, in fact, I think he shot a lot of his film Greener in his um, apartment. So I knew him. And then um, when we got both got out of school, we had some times where I think I borrowed some lights from him. And then there was a job he did where he borrowed my 35 system and we were supporting each other. I mentioned that I did a little Fruitopia commercial. He actually worked on that with me uh, while he was in between gigs. So we, you know, we knew each other. OK, so yours down the line, he's done Kung, Kung Fu Panda. And I think we ran into each other. We were both in line to see Mobius speak at the CTN conference. And he said, yeah, I'm trying to decide if I'm going to do this film. These, this French company wants me to do The Little Prince. And at that point, I'd never heard of the book Little Prince. I didn't know what he was talking about. And even when he described it to him, I didn't understand what it kind of what it was. But we were just standing in line and he was just telling me about it. And he was actually talking to me about like story conundrums he was having. And uh, anyone who knows me knows that I'd, I'd love to just give, you know, whatever my two cents are about, you know, story stuff. So anyway, um, then some time goes by. The job is actually kind of real for him. And at that point, I directed the Shins music video, uh, A Rifle Spiral, which was a stop motion piece. I co-directed it with Alex Juhas, who did all the design on it and he built the puppets and he's an amazing artist. And I worked with him on a lot of projects over like a 10 year span. And he was just so fun to work with because he was so talented first as an illustrator. And then he started getting into um, sculpting and was doing amazing sculpting work. And so it was at a point where he was getting into the sculpting that I said, Hey, let's do like a proper stop motion, not like just a cutout thing. We'd done a couple of cutout things for the United Airlines. Let's do like some real characters. And so he got to sculpt some characters and we did the Shins video. And, you know, it wasn't like a huge hit. It wasn't like a, a viral a sensation or anything. But amongst animators and stop motion people, they definitely kind of knew about it. And, and Mark had paid attention to it. You know, Mark had gotten the idea to pitch the parts of the movie that were the little prints proper from the book. He pitched, why don't we do this in stop motion? 
And once that kind of got okayed, then he brought me out to Paris. It was kind of fun. I went out there and he showed me all the storyboards and everything that they were doing and said, do you want to bring your team to Montreal and do this section of the film and you'll have your own building and, you know, you guys will be, you know, you'll have some freedom to kind of do your thing. Because one thing that I had developed over the years doing commercials was I, I like to work with a small, talented crew. And movies tend to get really, they, they tend to, to have to turn to more of a system. And I understand that need, but um, I wanted to approach the little prince the way that I approach the smaller project, which is you have a tight group of talented people and you try to do as much of that work between you as possible. So um, anyway, so he brought me out there and he showed it to me and convinced me to move out to Montreal. And then Alex Juhas came came with me. And then we got Anthony Scott, who I'd worked with on the United States of Tara title sequence, which was uh, something we had done and won the Emmy for best titles uh, that year, best TV titles. That was a project for Steven Spielberg. I think, and then Anthony also worked on the Shins video. So me and Alex and Anthony were kind of like the core. We found our art director, Corinne Merrill, in Montreal, and she was amazing. And so the four of us became the heads of department. Yeah, so that's, you know, Mark kind of, he knew me, and he knew me long enough to know me well enough to trust me with the project, I guess. And then he also had liked the recent work that I'd been doing with Alex and felt that it fit the vibe. Yeah, so... I, you want me to back up and, and talk a little bit about Dragon Frame? Or? Yeah, I'm, well, uh, yeah, let's switch gears a little bit. I'm wondering, um, maybe during while you were doing all this, what was the point that made made you say like, you know what, I'm going to pursue building a software for stop motion specifically? Okay, so to, I'll just I'll try to make this quick, but um, <laughs> so I'm shooting stop motion while I'm in college, and I need a controller for the camera and so I built a little box with the help from another teacher who knew electronics really well and all the box did was fire off a stepper motor to go around once and that would be my frame and I had a potentiometer on it to adjust the speed of it when I got out of school and I was you know trying to just make it out there with my gear I thought okay I got to hook this thing up to a computer so we hooked the drivers that drive the motor to a computer a little apple II. And I started programming just something that would make the motor go around and, and give me um, easy ways to change like exposure times. And I brought the system home to Ojai and my brother, Diami, who was probably like 14 or 15 at the time, he's a much better programmer than I was. Um, he was really taking it seriously. At and 14 he, years old. <laughs> oh yeah, I think he had his first computer at nine, you know, and he was uh, writing apps for people in town to like take care of their um, addresses and like their oh mailing gosh. list and stuff at age like 12 or 13. So he really knew his stuff. And he just said, okay, hand this thing over to me. What do you want this thing to do? Could it keep track of exposures where that go like forward and backwards and forward and backwards? Or like, could it, you know, cause I was doing all these in-camera stuff. And so he just starts layering in all these things for me. And he and I would work on this program on and off. And all that did was control my 35 camera to shoot. And then he added an element of it that could calculate simple camera moves in it for me. But those camera moves weren't going out to motors. The camera moves would put up data for me to move my hand crank motion control system to like the next number. You know, like, you know, I'd look on the screen. Okay, I'm on, I'm on this frame. Okay, I got to go to, you know, 66.2 on this dial. Oh, my and goodness. We actually, we shot so many things that way. Actually, the first... And second, uh, United Airlines commercial were done that way. There was no motion control on all those shots. It was all hand crank stuff. And we would actually hand it over to the animator to do. We'd generate the list of positions for them. And then they would hand crank the the gear, you know, the stuff. So, so, so you were we using that. this like Jimmy rig system for about a decade, it seems, I guess. Oh, yeah, for sure. Oh, wow. Um, and I actually like having less like not having another computer, like a Cooper running. Like I actually liked having less technology in the room during those days. It was manageable. And then there was some point in the late 90s, I think it was the Fruitopia commercial that I asked Diami if he could make a Mac-based frame grabber. And back then the Macs actually just had like a video in plug on the back. He made a you know Mac-based frame grabber. Now I will say as far as frame grabbing goes, when I was doing those like KCRW ads and some of that early stuff, I had purchased a SVHS security deck, okay? And this was kind of a thing for a little while in the 90s. You would get this deck 
and you would set it up with a button that could shoot single field. So if you know video, it's this weird thing where like there's actually 60 fields, there's you know 30 frames, but there's 60 fields. So when they would transfer 24 frame per second footage, it was actually two fields, three fields, two fields, three fields. We had a button that could shoot single fields because it was like security deck made to go really slow, right? Like taking a frame every second. And so we'd have this button and while we're shooting, we'd also have to remember, okay, shoot the film. Okay, now go over and click, click, you know, with the, the video thing. And you couldn't watch it as you were going, but when you were done, you'd have to shoot a bunch of frames at the end so that it would actually play through. And then you'd, you'd watch it and see if you'd messed up. So you could at least see if you had to redo the shot without waiting for dailies to come back. But then Diami made this Mac-based frame grabber. And so there was a couple projects that we set the camera next, like a video camera next to the film camera. Now, somewhere around that time, I think is when the Munchbox also came out. And then I moved out of, I wasn't doing a lot of stop motion. So the whole Lunchbox phase, I kind of missed that. It was an era in the late 90s, again, where I'd moved on to more live action music videos. I, did, I wasn't really aware of the, of the Lunchbox. So what was the point where you were like, okay, I have, this, I have this system set up. I got my brother helping me. I'm working on some commercials. Now I want to actually take it to the next step and create. Right what is now the best in class stop motion software out there. Okay, so the reason that Dragon Frame is called Dragon is because the United Airlines Dragon commercial, I had a choice to make. I thought I'd shoot on film like I always had, but I also own this little uh, Leica Digilux 2 point and shoot camera that has beautiful lens on it. And it was a digital camera. And I was using that to shoot elements for my After Effects projects. I would shoot an element on that. And it was kind of like a cheap way to scan kind of cool stuff in. And so I shot some tests with it. I thought, you know, this image is great. It's even got a little bit of kind of noise in it um, in the low end, which kind of resembles film grain. It also had a video out. So I told my brother, I said, this thing's got video. So we have a live view. It was like 320 by 180. It was like some, it was like half normal video size, just nothing. And so we combined sort of the ideas of all the controls that we had on the camera controller and his Mac-based frame grabber and kind of put those ideas together for the first time. So we were building sets and building characters and designing and shooting tests at stills. Meanwhile, Diami's in San Diego writing code so that we have a way to shoot the thing. And so Wait, he did would, you hire him or he's just doing this in his spare time or what? I think we I think we had a, we put it in the budget and it wasn't, you know, oh, okay. it wasn't a lot of money. <laughs> I think we put in our budget, a little tech budget, and we paid him a little bit. And he made a thing. I think we called it the Kaliri Motion Machine or something like that. I, I don't know whatever it was called, but it was just some, you know, it, it wasn't pretty. I remember at that point, the Mac UI had all those like gooey gel buttons and stuff. They were kind of 3D looking. I don't know if you remember that, but there was like kind of a weird UI kind of look that they had. Yeah, anyway, yeah, yeah. yeah. it was not pretty. It was just a bunch of buttons and but it did some cool things and you could bring in a lineup layer. So we had to do that for some of our effects and uh, the resolution was, I can't believe how smooth the animation is on that piece considering the, how low resolution that thing is. <laughs> we worked with this animator, Kim Blanchett, and that was the first time I had really worked with a professional stop motion animator who had done really high level character complex stuff. And he was a total character, really fun, thick Boston accent. And he really kind of told us what was important. You know, he was the one that sort of explained like, no, none of the animators use onion skin. It's really about stepping to live. And he just kind of like laid out what he needed and everything that, or that he thought he needed. And as he would come up with ideas for what he could use, we would implement them. And then I had what I needed as a cinematographer and director. So that we shot that whole commercial on this uh, Leica point and shoot camera. And it ended up winning all these awards and stuff. It was kind of funny. It was just shot on the dinkiest camera. But that, that was like the first incarnation of that. And then I was using the program on a commercial in LA for um, kind of like Pier 1 kind of store, but that's not what it was. I can't remember what it was now. But we were moving all these objects around. And the animator was Tennessee Norton Reed. And I was the animation supervisor on it. And I had my equipment. And they were shooting on film, but we were using my little program from the video tap off the camera. And Tennessee said to me, you know, this program is great. There's nothing really out there for professionals. And there's going to be a new Nikon camera coming out that has Live View integrated in it. And I think you guys should seriously consider like making a company 
and selling this. Before that, I don't know if it occurred to me to really do that. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know if we really thought there was a market for it. But um, so we decided to do it. And my brother and I, you know, we had seen my parents do some um, make some attempts at small businesses that had failed pretty epically. And so we were very cautious. And I would say cautiously optimistic, but I don't even know how optimistic we were. We were just cautious. So Diami would do his programming after his day job. And I was designing the program in Photoshop. You know, I was feeding him these, you know, buttons and screenshots. And then we'd talk about it and how it's going to work. And I think the first version of Dragon Frame 1 had the animation workspace, and I think it had a cinematography workspace, but it was very limited. You would just shoot some test shots there, I think, and it would give you like a histogram. It was very simple. If there was audio, it was very simple. You just loaded in, you know, a yeah. track. I, there must have been audio because it was used professionally. So, yeah, so there must have been audio, but it was pretty simple. We were working on it through our second United Airlines spot, which was called Heart. So that was cool because Everybody was pushing on it. We had more animators. Everyone's trying it, finding bugs in it. And oh, yes, you're, you know, you're sharing it with all your animator friends then? No, just on my jobs. Oh, okay, I see. Again, we did this crazy thing where we rented a big house in Ojai. This was a three-story kind of McMansion in the hills. And people lived there and then would wake up and then start filming. <laughs> it was a little <laughs> bit like a, a bad real world show or something. It was a little, it got a little crazy. But we had, you know, different rooms, different shots going on. And so animators would, you know, give feedback. And I would see how I was working with the cameras. And um, we then, uh, before we released version one, we also added Canon support. And I think the first, I think it went live in March 2008. Hmm. We, we had the website going. One of the first companies to use it was Cup of Coffee. So oh, no are they, aren't they Toronto? Well, they were. Unfortunately, they're not. Um, they're not here anymore. But That's yeah, that would have been prime time for a cup of coffee, two thousand and eight. Yeah. So, right. So they started using it. You know, they really pushed on it hard. They were shooting all these TV shows, and so I actually flew out to meet them and kind of talk to the animators and get a kind of, a, you know, on the ground uh, reports from them how it was working. And and luckily, because I understand animation and and. And I understand the process. When I go to talk to an animation team, I understand what's going on. Or I talk to a camera team. It's, it's not an abstract, right. you know, yeah. pro problems that they're telling me about. So yeah, so that's where when it got started. And then it just, you know, word got out. We didn't put any money into advertising. We didn't spend anything except our own effort. Uh, and then it just slowly started to. Oh, we got a sale today. Oh, we got a sale on Wednesday. <laughs> Oh, nice. oh my gosh, we're selling we're selling one one every day. Oh, now we're selling two every day. Like it just started to snowball as word went out. And then I think the big jump for us was to convince the feature films to use it. Hmm. And Three Mill Studio was doing with Disney was doing Frankenweenie. Some of the people on Frankenweenie had come off of Coraline. Now I didn't mention it, but I also worked on Coraline as an art director for a little while. At the end of Coraline, I was actually we were sending them beta versions of Dragon Frame to use on their test stations. And some of the guys had used it on their test stations and saw how quickly it shot, saw how much better it was from their in-house. Their in-house system was a little bit um, slow and a little complicated. And so those guys went on to Frank and Weenie and they said, well, what about this Dragon Frame? Can we try it? So they started testing it. And then I flew out to meet them in the UK and showed them that we were adding DMX support lighting support and that was great because they were trying to solve that i actually was in the room and i sh showed them the dmx box and they pointed to the back corner and said look at that mess and it was like this dmx <laughs> board and some crazy you know electronics projects going on and they were trying to work out how are we going to you know automate all of our dmx lighting and so i kind of was showed up with the right piece of gear at the right time they really stuck with us they had a problem. They had a couple of small problems with some of the lip sync starting to shift a little bit. And my brother actually flew out there as soon as they had the problem and sat in the studios in a corner, like until the problem got fixed. Oh, and, wow. Uh, yeah. Has, it, has I mean, it really just been you and your brother working on Dragon Frame this whole time? As far as building the program, yes. And it yeah. is, it's, it's definitely been a massive effort. Like I have to take you know, like a year off on a redesign, like to go from four to five or, you know, from three to four to do all the um, graphic design. And, and it, you know, it takes up all my brother's uh, 
time. It's a, it's a huge program at this point with the uh, motion control. And I mean, it's, it's pretty vast, but we've had other people come in to do electronic stuff. We're not electronic engineers. So to build the DMX box, uh, Steve Sweetie mm-hmm. did that. And we had DMC 16 and DMC plus like the motion control interfaces. So you were just saying about the DMX boxes, but I'm, I'm wondering, can you, can you go over the main components of Dragon Frame for somebody who's maybe not so familiar with working with it? The main workspaces, and so there's an animation workspace, and some people yeah. may get the program and only kind of live in the animation workspace. That space has got a lot of tricks in it. It's got a lot of ways to blow up the image and you know look at tight sections. It's got, it's got a lot of tools to draw you know, layers of increments if you wanted to. It's, you know, it's basically the area for the animator to refine their their animation as they're going. They can bring in other shots. Maybe they have to have some interplay with a shot on green screen that's from some other element. They can bring those in and take out the green screen. It's not a compositing program, but, you know, we can pull a mat so you can see an interaction between two characters shot in two different places. There's a lot of different things in that space for trying to sculpt out a, a, a performance. Then you've got audio, which is critical, you've got any lip sync. So there's a lot of tools in there to um, either kind of write out phonetics if that's the way you want to work. You know, some people just drop in the audio and just listen to it as they go and they kind of sculpt a mouth shape as they go. But normally you'd want to plan that out a little bit before. So you're not having to think about mouth shapes as you're also you know dealing with everything else. And so you could have a bunch of characters with different lines, readings loaded into that audio workspace. And you can um, you can also use, if you've done 3D printing, you've got 3D printed mouths. You can load those in as Photoshop layers and you can right, play yeah. them back to see what that's going to look like. And then we have the cinematography workspace, which is just a place to check that the photography is actually looking right. And you would normally be in there first. So you normally start in the cinematography workspace to just, is, you know, is the aperture right? Is, you know, is the shot looking good? And you can control the camera from that space. You don't have to go over to the camera. So you you have full control. And all those controls of all the bazillion cameras, those all have to be taken care of one at a time by Diami. And he's got, he's established quite an amazing camera control library that actually other people rent from us uh, because wow. it's so yeah. um, well put together. And then- also um, sounds like a nightmare to track. <laughs> Yeah, it's such a nightmare to track. And it was harder at the beginning. Like we really had a hard time. I remember Nikon was like a kind of a spaghetti mess to deal with their SDKs, their controls. Like each camera would be different. It would they weren't using the same kind of protocols all the time. And maybe they've sorted that out by now. Yeah, so that's been that's actually been one of the toughest things about the pro- program is just making sure it's compatible with as many yeah. cameras, you know. And there's always somebody still who's like, But I've got this weird camera and I'm the only person in the world with it. And why doesn't it work? Get a different our camera? one. <laughs> you know, like uh, all the time, like, well, we got this Olympus, it. you know, and it's kind of old, but it still works. Like, you know what? We can't, we can't like stop what we're doing for one, one camera. Um, but we do try to do as many as we can. Mm-hmm. And then we have uh, the DMX lighting. So you, I think we now have 512 separate controllable channels of, of DMX lighting controls, you know, and a lot of that's moving over to LED uh, dimmables and stuff, which is kind of cool. But it's a pretty advanced interface in there for doing that stuff. And then uh, we have motion control. So that's yeah. kind of a gigantic section of the program because motion control alone, I mean, if you were just going to buy an off-the-shelf version of our motion control software, it would be would not be $300. You know, <laughs> motion control software is pretty expensive. But we just throw it in there because, you know, I'm a big believer in everybody having the most professional tool in their toolbox, even if they might not be ready for it. You know, I, I want to give my kid a real guitar, not a plastic one. The people who are buying Dragon Frame are taking whatever they're doing seriously. They're going to, you know, spend $300. You know, that means that this isn't just a little weekend project. This means that they're building sets that are probably going to cost them more money than they really know when they started. And they're going to build characters that are going to cost them. They're going to be well into thousands of dollars by the time they're done with their film. And so they take it seriously enough to buy the software. So we want to give that person the full suite. Other yeah. people have told us, oh, you should sell like a lot of different versions of your program at different price points. But one thing I loved about film was that I had a 35 millimeter motion picture camera. It was a very 2C. And what I thought was so amazing about it was that during those film years, the technology kept getting better and better, but the technology was in the film stock. So I'd have my camera. I could just, the new film stock is made by Kodak or whoever. 
I can put that in my camera and I'm shooting the same film stock that they're shooting Terminator 2 on or whatever. And yeah. I loved that accessibility to the professional level. That to me was one thing I loved about film is that, I mean, now with the digital, it's like, oh, you know, who can afford these really expensive cameras? But anyway, so I try to keep Dragon Frame somewhat affordable, but also completely the same product. If you've got Dragon Frame, you have the same thing that they're shooting Kubo and the two strings with. You have the same thing that they're shooting the little prints with. That, you know, it's, it's the same piece of software on that computer. Well, yeah, and I know, like I used it for the first time last summer, and it seriously upped my game in terms of creating something that looked very professional immediately. Just opening up and using it connected to a camera, <laughs> it's uh, very powerful. And I'm wondering, you know, there's all these components. You've got, I don't even know how many features. Are there some kind of more interesting features that not a lot of people know about that you find are are really useful or whatnot? Well. Um... You know, there are things, I mean, I think you took advantage of the um, increment editor. Is that right? Yeah, I, I love that. That was that was a lifesaver when figuring out like jumping and like how far something is going to shoot and stuff. Yeah, that's one that I often find that people don't know about. You know, they don't know about that. Um, I just discovered it randomly. I was just playing around. <laughs> just like clicking on things. There's a whole, if you have the right camera, there's a whole section in um, the kind of layer guides in the animation workspace, if you click on the camera down below, there's a couple more little tabs. And one of them is the um, mag uh, live view magnification tool, which can kind of blow up sections of the footage. Oh my gosh, I, would, I, I wish I had known about that before because I was in the actual camera viewfinder. I was clicking the magnifying glass to see if I was lining stuff up. Oh, no, no. <laughs> Yeah, it, it, it'll like position it for you. And I think we you can have actually up to eight different places in the frame now, I think, that you can blow up. And what you do is the three key, which is the go to live, you yeah. double tap it, it takes you from the widescreen and then to like the first like A composition and then the B composition and the C and then like however many of those you have set up, you just keep double tapping it. And when you double tap to the new one and you're blown up, then everything works, you know, all of your, um, like your, you know, flipping through the frames. Now you have a bunch of frames just on that close-up. So man, I <clears> wish <throat> we had this chat before. <laughs> <laughs> well, one just thing save me so do, much time and headache. <laughs> one one thing everybody should do as Dragon Frame is just go to the tutorials on our website. And just they're not very long. Just sit there and just yeah. make your way through all of them. Because we I'm try someone to touch who has to click around to learn. So I I need to go to those tutorials. <laughs> Yeah, even if you go to the tutorial, just so you know, oh, I know that thing is there. There's a kind of a cool feature where you can bring in footage uh, that is from a previous shot, if you want to know how it's going to cut, and you can bring that footage and line it up before frame one. So like zero uh -huh. frame and before. And so that way, when you hit playback and you're playing through your frames, it'll play through the last shot and then into the cut and into your next shot. And that's kind of a cool thing. That would have helped me too, because I was literally loading in the frames to the scene from the scene before to figure that out. So, <laughs> really, yeah. I really need to go into those tutorials. It sounds like <laughs> I just jumped in. I got a a little briefing from someone at the school who had some experience with it, and uh, I was like, "All right, I know enough now. I'm just gonna start shooting," and that's what I did. <laughs> well, a, a one um, one way to think about it is if you're running into the problem, chances are others yeah. have and we may have tried to fix it you know we may have tried to accommodate for th whatever that is like how do we cut into a shot you know things like that we may have and so you know even writing into support if you're not sure if you can't find something if you do you have a way to do this we'll write you back you know yeah um, yeah we well you guys are really responsive team. yeah we so diami and i do the we create the software but we have other people to do support and if they don't understand the question then it gets sent to us so support and shipping is done you know we're not you know putting keypads in boxes right right so can you give me a little bit behind the scenes of what dragon frame is like now like you mentioned you know you've got people working to create the software and put stuff in boxes and shipping and support and there's you and your brother like give me a little bit behind the scenes of how things are running these days Versus like when you were starting up and, you know, just creating it, which we got the whole well, behind the scenes there. Well, I'd, I'd have to say the biggest difference between the beginning and now is that now that we're kind of known as like the industry 
you know, standard. At first, we were just kind of fighting for our lives to like, you know, oh my gosh, we got to add this feature or no one's going to use it or we better add this or, you know, we're going to lose traction. And so there was a lot of, um, uh, we really ramped up our putting in um, features at the beginning in the first few years was quite a race to try to, you know, just get the software going. There was a lot of anxiety about competition and what things we were going to have or not have. Now that the program has gotten pretty fat, now it's more about refinement. And so it's not as stressful, I have to say. So there's things that I'm asking for to put in that I'll, I'll come up with an idea and then I'll pitch it to Diami. And, you know, I might be the only person in the world that's really wants this thing in it. Um, and so it's not like do or die, but it might be like, oh, that's a good idea. Let's get to that at some point. Now we do have studios who say, oh, we'd really like this, we would like this. And we get these lists from the studios and from animators uh, working on short films. And we'll, we're always putting those lists together and kind of putting them in a hierarchy. Like, okay, which one of these, you know, what of these are very idiosyncratic? So the funny thing that we've learned about studio culture is that, you know, you have a couple of key animators that say, you got to do this thing this way. And then everybody will go, okay, we got to do it that way. And then you'll go to another studio and there'll be a few people that say, you got to do it this other way. And so you have one whole studio filled with people saying, you've got to do this. And then you've got another whole studio going that you could never animate a movie like that. You got to do this other way. And so, yeah. so these kind of little, so you have to decide like, is this just a, an idiosyncratic kind of mini culture where everyone's kind of obsessing over this thing that they need? Or is this something that every person that buys the software could use? And so that process of, of making those decisions is kind of a constant. We also have things that go in the back burner and then you know eventually get done. Like I really wanted to have this iPad app that you could look on the iPad, see what's through the camera, and then you connect these game controllers on the side of the iPads called Game Vice, and they would actually drive the motion control around. And so you could look through the iPad app, drive the controller, see what's through the lens, check focus, set keyframes, uh, jog motors, basically do all this stuff that controls, you're basically remote controlling the motion control workspace. And that I had put on the table years ago and it just seemed like too much of a headache. But just recently my brother was like, hey, let's, let's do this thing. So I started designing. I mean, we had a working version so quickly and we had to work out the bugs and stuff, but you know, we just kind of jumped on it and I've got my, I've got a motion control rig here and uh, it's called Arc Pilot and it's already being, you know, used on some real productions right now up in Portland. So, um, nice. you know, so sometimes, you know, but see, that's the kind of thing where it's fun and it's, it's really kind of a nifty thing that, that works well if you're trying to program camera moves, but yeah. you know, 99% of our users are not going to need that app. You know, but, but who knows if that, cause one of the things that stop motion is it's not exactly limited to, but it's still frame shots because it's so hard to do like nice camera movements with a stop motion shot. So maybe, maybe that'll change. Maybe creating this is going to change how people approach situations. I don't know, but well, it, it also sounds that... like you're, <laughs> go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to say, go it sounds like you're very intertwined with what's going on in the industry to make sure that dragon frame is constantly evolving to meet what people want out of it, which I think is amazing and really hard to do as a, you know, to be that agile as a software company. Yeah. Um, and that's why having it just be my brother and I is, is good for, for quickly, you know, making decisions. And, you know, I went up to Leica and met with them and, and uh, one of the things that they asked for, was having more of these close-up windows. And the, and the reason was because, you know, they're shooting 4K, the screens now, it used to be you shoot on film and, you, and projection was shaky. Like if you, if you, in the old days, had a, a locked off 35 millimeter shot and you projected it in a, across a huge movie theater, if you went up and put your finger on the edge of a table or something, you'd, it would just, you'd see that it was moving all around. You know, like the, the frame would actually kind of jiggle. Do you get what I'm saying with my yeah, yeah, exactly. yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, but digital digital projection is just so just there. I almost describe it as like a wall, where film projection is more like a window, because it, it would kind of move around and it was like a little bit like your mind had to kind of grab a hold of it. The digital projection is just so solid and so high resolution that the animators they cannot fake anything. They got to you know they got to move the eyes. They got to be just perfect, and so they're now really using a lot of these close-up 
what we mm-hmm. call live view magnification windows. And I went up there maybe a year and a half ago, and they said, can you give us, you only give us four, can you give us you know, more or whatever it was, or maybe we only did two, whatever it was, we weren't giving them enough. And at first I was really kind of like, is this one of those weird idiosyncratic things? But they, they were like, no, Jamie, let's look at what we have to do. And we have a character we have in the background and we gotta make it perfect. And you know, that was something that we kind of jumped on right away. And that's not something I would have thought of at all. I would not have thought of that that was a thing. But the animator's needs have always been something I have to really open up my ears to. I'm more on the camera side and the cinematography and the lighting and the motion control. That's my focus. So when the animators talk, I have to kind of tune into kind of seeing it through their eyes. Gotcha. I'm wondering, um, you mentioned, you know, studios use it and whatnot. Are there kind of segments of different users that use Dragon Frame? Studios one on the one hand and then, you know, independent animators on the other hand. Are there other segments that I'm not thinking of that might use this? Yeah, there are people who use it for experimental things. There's some people that use it just for photography, like instead of like a capture one, you know, kind of a thing. Mm. But I would say independent animators, whether that's someone in school or that's like a small team that's decided to make a film. I think that's probably most of our sales are just a couple people or one person says, I'm going to make something or small studios like uh, kind of like animation teams. I think that's kind of our biggest market. It has to be someone who's really taking it seriously, I guess, because there are so many, um, you know, inexpensive, if not free options to shoot stop motion. So you must also have a good idea of, you know, how many people are kind of shooting stop motion professionally around the world, I guess, because if you're going to, I mean, there are other competitors out there, but you're kind of the main software. So do you have an idea of how many animators and stop motion there are kind of in the world? (laughs) I don't, I don't know. The one thing I don't know is I don't know how many people like buy the software on a whim. Like, I don't know if someone's like, yeah, stop mm. motion. I got money. <laughs> you know, like Probably a few. You know what I mean? Like, I don't they know. They invest and then realize what it takes and then they, they never touch yeah, it again. How many, yeah, I don't know if we get a lot of those. I hope we don't. I, I'd hope that, that people who are doing it are, are serious. But I would say there's definitely more stop motion now in the world than there's ever been. I mean, stop yeah. motion, when I was doing it in college, was like, you were just like a weirdo. Like, what are you gonna do? You mean like Gumby? Like what? Um, there was a stop motion contingency out there, but it was in the live action movie effects. So there was a lot of people in Hollywood that knew how to do stop motion, but that was because they were they had to you know make a Tauntaun move or whatever you know like right. they yeah. had to do that kind of stuff. And so when that died away to CG, there was a whole kind of segment that fell away, and those guys either stopped working or they had to learn how to do CG. And then there was kind of like some fringe, like commercial people that did stop motion. Um, There was like the Pillsbury Doughboy commercials. There's like certain sets of commercials that were like, oh, you know, there's one guy that does those or, and then MTV, you know, that opened up. There was a little bit more, but it wasn't, there wasn't that much going on. Uh, There was more experimental film work in probably in Europe that was stop motion. You had uh, the guy that did the California Raisins. Um, Will who's Vinton. that? Yeah, you had the Will Vinton studio. Yeah. But that was it, like in America, as far as a studio that was dedicated to stop motion. That, that was it. I mean, you had the Kyoto Brothers, but they did a little bit of everything. And they did, like, feature effects stuff. Right, um, yeah. yeah. But now it's kind of massive. I mean, you just see it by looking online at how many short films are being made and how many commercials and music videos, it's just everywhere. And then oh, yeah. the feature it's, films people are gobbling it up. Cause it's, it's like a, animations everywhere nowadays. And, and it's like a unique form. Could, could you, do you have an idea? Like, could you estimate how many, like what the industry is like right now? Is it compared? I mean, I'll just say that we have, there's, you know, I'm not going to give an exact number, but there's definitely tens of thousands of users out there that are using dragon frame. I mean, that's yeah. encouraging for me to hear because when I when I left high school back in, oh gosh, 2000 and whatever, seven, six or seven, like I, there was like nothing going except for a cup of coffee, really. There was not that much going on in stop motion. And so I just, I didn't see it on TV. I didn't see it in movies. So I just didn't pursue it, <laughs> even though that was what I did every single night after school. So um, I'm glad that there are tens of thousands of people around the world using it now, that's that's encouraging to hear. <laughs> oh yeah, oh yeah. And, and I've seen, 
lately a few ads. I don't know if it was on Instagram or where, but I've definitely seen ads for companies saying we need stop motion animators. You know, there's oh, yeah. a yeah. there's there's a I saw bunch of features posting around. Yeah. So there's um you know there's a features there's a bunch of features going on in Portland right now. Mm -hmm. And that's like, you know, sucking all the animation talent up there. And so there's actually a need now. So, so you're also, so you're kind of like at the forefront of, and in, in terms of stop in stop motion, you know, the art form and the technology, um, and the technology has already been kind of like a game changer for the format. Do you have a sense of what the next kind of thing is going to be game changer for stop motion? Or are we kind of hitting the peak of, uh, like talent and technology and and the art form itself. Well, I don't think I know what will happen in the future. I didn't see film going away. I I can't say that I I know what's going to happen. I, I will say that um, it looks like LED lighting is going to kind of take over. You know, as it becomes more affordable. We just got some of those at our at our school in the studio. Um, everything was uh, those very hot studio lights before. <laughs> Right, right. It's so much nicer when you're not melting. You know, in the old days, if you were shooting, like, if you had to be at F-16 and and you were shooting on some, you know, 200 speed stock, whatever, you're just like on fire in there. Oh, um, yeah. I I actually got a sunburn from being so close to them in the studio <laughs> on oh, my no. face. My nose is peeling. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I think the LED lighting will be a change. The, the thing that is a question mark for me is... Will the photography angle ever change? So, mm. you know, will there be some thing that someone uses a camera that's got, you know, 10 little lenses on it that then calculates focus the or like, oh, yeah. Yeah. Like, does it become synthesized? Does this photography become synthesized? I hope it does because I really like the simplicity of, you know, lighting through a lens and picking a lens and all of that. And I, and also, if you make some system that gives you 20 options when you're done it's going to um de detract from uh well it's it's kind of like that in cg already in cg world when you're setting up shots within a computer you have all these uh, um, like options to choose from but from my understanding the people that really exceed in those roles or at least the people that i've talked to also have a strong photography and real life background because um you're trying to mimic that art form from real life yeah I think that, uh, I mean, I did a bunch of still life stuff that kind of helped me do that, but then I did a lot of portrait photography. But mm. I will say that most of the people in the animation world, even in the, the, the bigger picture of, of CG or 2D or whatever, they, they don't just look at animation. Most of what they'll look at are brilliant live action films for framing, for timing, for uh, ideas that maybe would have been easier to try to pull off um, in a live action scenario with, oh, let's just shoot this this way that you can't just go, oh, let me just shoot this 10 second stop motion shot that's going to take three weeks this way. You know, most of the time when they're, when people are in this business, the successful people are talking about studying a sequence or, or look at what this director did, they're mostly talking about live action mm -hmm. stuff. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Are you, are you still directing yourself these days? There's a little piece that I need to finish up that I started a couple of years ago with Haley Morris that I, I, I DP'd and we're kind of co-directing. But no, right now, um, I'm just kind of chilling with my family and uh, actually I'm kind of gearing up for Dragon Frame 5 to start to, to work on that. I guess if, you're also being forced to chill with your family right now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So yeah, I don't know where my directing is going to go at this point. I'm, I'm going to have to start doing something, but uh, I'm not sure what that's going to be. Well, it, sound, it sounds like you're in a nice place right now, though. So um, I'm just wondering to wrap it up, maybe one more question. Um, so, you know, thinking back on kind of your career or just your journey, you know, you started off in film and then saw some opportunity and were given opportunities in animation and saw that through and then software, et cetera. So, you know, for somebody who knows they want to get into the industry or stop motion specifically, um, and you've had success as a director and a developer and a business owner, et cetera. What is, what is your advice to them if they're unsure of the exact path they should take, but they just want to get into it? Kind of, kind of like how you started, I guess. Well, I guess it depends on what you want to do. If somebody wants to be a stop motion animator, then they have got to do a lot of stop motion animating and they've got to get some serious um, mentors in that area and they've got to take it seriously and they've got to 
compare their work to the really good stuff. And and that's just like playing an instrument. You just got to do it. You got to practice. And you got to get mm-hmm. on it. That was never my thing. I was more of a director. And so I wanted to be really in control of the visuals. So I poured my technical interest into understanding everything I could about modern cinematography. So, you know, if you've got an area that already piques your interest, just try to do it. So I shot a lot of stuff in college and and uh, as I got out of school, you know, just shooting constantly. And so you have to practice and you got to study. And then if you if you want to direct or maybe even on the DP side of things, you really, really need to just study filmmaking. And you're going to have an advantage over anybody who thinks, well, you know, there's no rules. You know, you just rules are made to be broken. OK, they are. But. You know, sometimes you got to tell a story. And I personally have benefited from telling very simple stories. That's kind of, and sometimes I'll even purposely slow things down because that's that's the way I like to go. Really trying to know your filmmaking is going to, that's going to help you no matter what you do. So if you're an animator and you're on a, a shot and maybe the director is green and they're telling you to do this thing and you go, well, wait, how's that? Is that going to cut? You're coming from the wrong angle or are you sure this is what you want? You know, do you want me to, you want me to, you know, start 20 frames earlier before the ball bounces so there's a, you have a little area to move the edit. If you know the process of making a film and you understand the problems that can happen in editing, you are going to be helping out in whatever position you're in because you're going to spot potential problems and you're going to make the product better. So, you know, one thing I would say to someone who's new is I've really taken a lot of advantage of frame rate. To me, frame rate is kind of a a malleable thing, like the frame rate that you shoot at and that you also... Mm project at like the shins video i think we did the entire shins video at 15 frames per second so knowing that youtube and whatnot can just you don't have to make it 30 you don't have to make it 29.97 you could make it whatever and it'll play that video so we did that at 15 frames per second we did everything at that you know even did the camera was made a little bumpy but um you know i knew that that would work and it saved us a lot of frames of shooting It saved us also frames of having to do twos. So we didn't, you know, we didn't do like 24 and twos or 30 on twos. I just said, no, I'm setting everything to 15 frames. You're not going to have to worry about going click, click each time. And then we, we set up our editing at 15 frames. You know, I think maybe if it was going to be broadcast, it wouldn't be, it would just be a a button switch to export one at 29.97. It wouldn't be a big deal at all. But I've definitely, you know, played with that. The little prints. 12 frames per second for all the animation, camera moves on ones, knowing that you could get away with 12 frames per second and that it would add a sense of feeling the animation. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And it actually makes it easier. When you go to ones, it's you have the possibility of making it smoother, but you also have the possibility of making it jerkier. Because yeah. you have all these you have these single frames that could pop up and could go, you know, get really raggedy on you. 12s is more forgiving. So when we set up to do the little prints, I said, no, we're just gonna animate on on um on twos now that we had to do actually on twos shoot two frames because we had camera moves on ones but understand frame rate shoot some things uh, you know at eight frames a second shoot, shoot something at 12 shoot something at 15 because you might get a client all they need is this little thing and from beginning to end you're going to shoot the whole project you have control you know maybe they say well our deliverable is 29.97 okay well you shoot at 15 it looks great then you put in after effects and then you kick out a 29.97 and give it to them makes sense yeah I mean, uh, that's something that I didn't really think of firsthand, but yeah, it's uh, it's good to be agile with uh, with frame rate when it comes to what you're doing in the project. So, yeah, is there any is there anything else you'd like? Oh, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. I was gonna say, is there anything else you'd like to share? I'm very grateful for you know all this stuff that I've gotten to do, and yeah. uh, getting to make Dragon Frame is is a lot of fun for us, and we take it very seriously. And yeah, I just hope everybody enjoys it. Nice. Well, thank you so much for coming on the chat, Jamie. It's been an absolute pleasure to have you and hear the wonderful story of how Dragon Frame came to be and also your directing career. Yeah, Yeah, thank you so much. Of course. And if you're listening and you'd like to follow Jamie's work, you can check out his Vimeo page, which I'm going to include in the link of this podcast description. And if you're interested in Dragon Frame, of course, you can go to dragonframe.com and check all that out. And thank you so much for listening. And that's all for now. Okay, bye.